Welcome. And thank you for joining us today from uh, whether you're joining us from Cornell or uh, from uh, anywhere all over the world. My name is Mustafa Minawi, and I'm the director of Critical Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Studies Initiative and an associate professor of history here at Cornell University. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that Critical Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Studies is part of Cornell University, and it is from uh, where I'm speaking to you right now. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Ohono, uh, the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga Ohono are members of an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and indeed the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Cayuga Ohono uh, dispossession and honor the ongoing connections of Kaiko Ono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This is the first event of Critical Ottoman and Post Ottoman Studies, or as we would like to call it, COPOS uh, <laughs> uh, for short. The mission for uh, Critical Ottoman and Post Ottoman Studies is to feature the latest in research um, about Southwest Asia. North Africa, Northeast Africa, and Southeast Europe, and their connections to one another and the wider world. The goal really ultimately is to establish Cornell University as the hub of innovative studies of this region, uh, which, ch uh, which challenges traditional understanding of how we look at that part of the world. From the study of our archeological heritage in the Ottoman Empire to critical policy analysis of current events, we aim to give a platform for scholars, artists, activists, and practitioners uh, that have fresh approaches to the study of this dynamic region, which is at the center of the Afro-Eurasian continent. Today's event is part of a series uh, where, that we are planning for this year. It is titled From the Inside Out in which we feature scholars who live and work in a country in the region using their research and disciplinary um, perspective or angle to give us their uh, um, view on the country from the inside out. In today's event, we focus on Turkey, uh, but you should stay tuned uh, because uh, for our next event, November 1st, uh, we will feature Iraq and Iraqi scholars, and it will be done in both English and Arabic with an Arabic-English interpreter. Then uh, we will have uh, um, uh, Armenia, uh, which will take place sometime in uh, late in November. So Armenia from the inside out, followed by Iran from the inside out. We will also be featuring new scholars that are doing cutting edge research, uh, pushing the study of the field beyond the traditional paradigms that a lot of us are familiar with uh, in short introductory videos that we'll post online, along with other activities. Uh, there will be a lot more activities come next semester. So please do stay tuned, sign up for our Twitter, um, uh, Instagram, or Facebook. Uh, the, our handle is Copus Cornell or Cornell Copos, forgive me. Before I turn to today's event, I would like to thank the INAUDI Center for International Studies for their steadfast support of Copos, and a special thank you to Pamela Hampton and Courtney Saab, uh, without whom none of this, uh, none of the organization of this event uh, could have ever happened, so thank you. But for now, I would like to turn to our speakers, Professor Sinan Erensu from uh, uh, Boazji University in Istanbul, and Professor uh, Bashak Can from Koch University also in Istanbul. We are also very lucky to have Professor Begum Adalet um, uh, as the moderator. Uh, Begum is a member of the COPO Steering Committee and an assistant professor in the Department of Government here at Cornell University. She is a political theorist with research and teaching interest in anti-colonial thought, transnationalism, uh, the Cold War, uh, development, the, the built environment, and the Middle East. She is also the author of uh, Hotels and Highways, the Construction of, a Modern of Modernization Theory in Cold War Turkey, which came out with Stanford. Her writings uh, have also appeared in political theory, comparative studies in society and uh, history, comparative studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, among other places. 
So for now, I would like to turn it over to Begum and I will join again towards the end of uh, the webinar. Begum, it's uh, now over to you. Thank you for that very kind uh, and generous introduction, Mustafa, and thank you for, for organizing this series. Uh, and thank you, Pamela and, and Courtney, for, for all your help in, in organizing the event. And especially thank you to, uh, to Professor John and Professor Eransu for joining us. And, and of course, thank you all uh, to our guests. We're, we're really excited to have you. And it's really a pleasure to be a part of this, this inaugural event of the From the Inside Out series. And I'm especially excited to be a part of this conversation uh, with two really uh, exciting, incredible, uh, productive scholars from Turkey who between the two of them have produced crucial work about human rights, the medical documentation of state violence, environmental and urban justice, and neoliberalism, among other things. Um, just to give it a bit of a context, uh, the past several years in Turkey have been marked by the intensification of a political economic order and accumulation strategies that prioritize construction, real estate, large-scale infrastructure-led growth. These projects have resulted in the destruction of working class neighborhoods, the commodification of common spaces, increasing environmental degradation. And these developments have also taken place in the context of the restructuring of the Turkish state from a parliamentary system to a presidential one, the implementation of centralized governance mechanisms, the hollowing out and remaking of public institutions, countless executive decrees and other measures. These processes have also been closely connected to the struggle for academic freedom in Turkey, including the forced resignation of hundreds of academics who participated in or supported the Gezi Park uh, uprisings in 2013, the vast purge and per persecution faced by academics who signed the We Will Not Be a Party to This Crime petition that criticized human rights violations against Kurds in 2016, and most recently ongoing protests at Boğaziçi University in response to uh, President Erdogan's use of an emergency decrees to uh, appoint an unelected rector, uh, a longtime member of the ruling Justice and Development Party, which was in violation of the established rules and practices and the governance of the university. So our conversation today, I hope, will also have implications for a set of questions like, what is the relationship between the ruling party, AKP's uh, increasing authoritarianism, its policies of neoliberalization and securitization on the one hand, and its crackdown on dissident academics on the other. How have our speakers navigated the restrictions that have been placed on academic research, and knowledge production, and what have both academic and popular mobilization and resistance looked like under decades of AKP rule? Would it be possible to see, speak also about interdependence and solidarity between various struggles for educators, for students, but also for other groups who have been subject to exploitation, oppression, and state violence in the past several decades. Uh, our first speaker, Sinan Eransu, is an assistant professor of sociology at Boğaziçi University in Istanbul. His research and teaching areas include political ecology, urban and environmental soci sociology, climate justice, energy infrastructures, and speculative urbanism. Professor Eransu received his master's degree from the University of Cambridge and his PhD from the University of Minnesota, both in sociology. Before joining Boğaziçi, he was a Cayman Modern Turkish Studies postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University and a marketer uh, IPC fellow at the Istanbul Policy Center. And he's currently also a re collaborating researcher at an uh, ERC H2020 project called The Urban Revolution and the Politica. Thank you, Sinan. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Great. Uh, well, greetings from Istanbul. Uh, Mustafa and uh, Begum, thank you, uh, both of you, for this lovely and insightful introductions. Um, I'm happy, glad, and very excited, to be honest, to be part of this panel, this webinar, this conversation. Um, my talk in the next 10 to 15 minutes will be about the uh, joy and challenges of holding our holding to our intellectuals homes and creating new ones in these turbulent times particularly when political and academic freedoms are in jeopardy uh, i'm an assistant professor of sociology at Boston university and i gave a job talk for this position all the way back in July 2017, 
And during that time, I was teaching and uh, finishing up my postdoctoral studies at Northwestern University. Uh, I had the, 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 I had my job offer for this position only a few weeks after, in August 2017, and accepted it uh, with excitement and after long consideration. Uh, but I was able to teach physically in one of Boazici's classrooms for the first time last week, four years and two months after the initial offer. Uh, so why? Did it take me so long to step into a Boazici classroom? Well, for the last uh, year and a half of it, it is COVID-19 pandemic to blame, obviously. And for the first nine months of it, it's bureaucratic paperwork. But what lies between the two is a different story. Uh, Boazici uh, is a public university which makes you a public employee if you work for it. And I was glad initially to hear that the recruitment takes a notoriously long time due to paperwork, uh, as that would give me enough time to finish my studies, my second year at Northwestern. In early August, 2018, after having sold or donated uh, all of our belongings, uh, we were ready to finish our 10 year long journey in the US and start a new one in Istanbul, my hometown, uh, with two fresh syllabi in my laptop. I was already answering student emails about my new university, uh, about, about, about new classes uh, regarding the upcoming semester, which was right around the corner. Uh, but two days before my departure, I received a very disturbing email uh, from my department at Boazici. The email was informing me in regret that my hire was blocked at the very final stage by the university president, the rector, as it's referred to as uh, in Turkey. Uh, despite their efforts, talking about my department, that wasn't much they could do. The problem had something to do with my security clearance and otherwise routine document prepared for all new public employee recruits. Apparently, for some reason, mine was thick enough to scare the rector off and back out from the hire. So the flight back to Istanbul, and I had to take it, uh, was the worst. Uh, I had so many mixed feelings, some of which I still retain until this day. But I really don't want to get into the nasty details of it and over-dramatize it, as I consider myself as one of the fortunate ones, compared to hundreds of colleagues and friends who were pushed out of Turkish academia and forced to live in exile for years. Uh, some of them can't even return for short visits. Those who can uh, feel so heartbroken and alienated for understandable reasons. I was fortunate as I somehow won a legal battle uh, that took a year and a half. And I was reinstated to my position right around the time when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, exploded. And Boazici, on the other hand, is now wrestling with a far bigger crisis, as uh, Begum uh, summarized perfectly, since the first days of this year. Uh, for the first time since the 1980 coup, Ankara appointed a new rector to the university without adhering to any sort of participatory mechanism with the clear uh, mission to transform the university in its own image. Uh, seven months later, they had to remove the guy the appointed rector from the office to the unprecedented, influential, unprecedentedly influential uh, protest campaign inside and outside the university. Yet most recently, they did the same mistake and filled the seat with the provost of the dismissed rector. Uh, unlike the previous one, the new rector is a faculty 
at Bozici. And he believes that he's in control or trying to show the image by pushing all time instructors outside the university. Yet the protest persists at different scale in so many different ways. Uh, I would love to address questions regarding the protest movement in Boazici in during the Q&A uh, session. Let, let me share with you some visuals at this, uh, at this point, some visuals from the protest. Uh, okay, uh, you're able to see them, see the visual, right? Okay. So that, that is my department, what we share it with psychology. Uh, this is a nice photo from the daily vigils, uh, right around 12, 15, uh, around noontime, uh, we stand in front of the, uh, the office of Rector. We turn our back to the building and stand there for 15 minutes. And it ends with uh, protest hand clap. Uh, this is a, a photo from one of the uh, public statements. And this is a close-up of that daily vigil. Uh, all right, uh, so for the, am I sharing anything at this point? No, maybe I should. Uh, no. some reason I'm not able to see my... I'll give it another try. It was going so smoothly, wasn't it? Until this point. Nope, I'm not able to. Interesting. All right. Uh, anyhow, maybe later. Uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to uh, talk rather about my other intellectual of home. It's called Center for Spatial Justice. Mekanda Adalet Derneği in Turkish, abbreviated as MAD. So MAD is an association founded back in 2016 with a small, by a small group of young scholars and activists interested in urban and environmental justice. Being away in the US, uh, my involvement in MAD, Center for Spatial Justice, was minimum during, first, during the first two years. Uh, during summer months, I was participating and organizing a summer school uh, with them uh, and also helping the association with it is semi-academic journal. Uh, and when, when my hire, uh, on the other hand, was blocked by the board's director, however, uh, the Association Center for Spatial Justice became a refuge for me, both in terms of, I mean, both physically, financially, as well as intellectually. In a short span of time, the center grew in size and reached beyond our expectations. Uh, four years ago, uh, when I returned to the, uh, to the country, the center was able to support only two full-time and one part-time employees. Now it has 14 full-time employees and moving into a, a second office. Um, so, well, let, let me try one more time because I should be able to share. Oh, yes. That's fantastic. You're still able to see it, right? Okay. So uh, I think I can summarize uh, the work of Center for Spatial Justice at three layers. We are a civil societal organization 
uh, producing work in uh, urban and environmental matters. Uh, our strength lies in our, I think, ability to work at different scales. We are able to uh, collaborate with grassroots activists, uh, urban and environmental activists uh, from different regions of the country on the one hand. And on the other hand, we are also um, participate with the work of uh, local administrations uh, at city level, as well as uh, we organize uh, panels and uh, projects and programs with interna international civil societal actors as well. Uh, this is one example that I'm proud of, and this is a type of work uh, sometimes very difficult to do in a um, academic setting. Uh, Yeshil Artvin Derni, Green Artvin Association, is one of the oldest environmental organizations in the country fighting against a gold mine in Artvin, the uh, northern eastmost province uh, of Turkey. Um, uh, we uh, are a longtime collaborator with the Green Artvin Association and in this particular uh, uh, publication, we were able to visualize and document uh, their 25 year or long struggles, uh, supported it with a lot of interviews, visual documents, and also um, included court verdicts of different sorts uh, into this publication. Uh, this is a series that is called Public Interest Litigation for Spatial Justice, and we'll be focusing on five different cases of urban and environmental uh, struggles uh, with a longstanding legal uh, following. Uh, and this, this was the first example of that. Um, and this is a more recent work. It's is kind of an installation uh, about Canal Istanbul, this mega project that is expected to be built uh, in seven years, connecting Black Sea to the Marmara Sea, an alternative waterway, 25 kilometer long waterway parallel to the uh, world known Istanbul, the Bosphorus uh, Strait. Uh, it will have devastating impact on the urban and environmental well-being of the city. And in this installation, we are uh, projecting um, accurate maps on the surface, uh, highlighting urban and environmental and agricultural and ecological as well as cultural uh, spotlights along the path of Canal Istanbul. And people are able to walk over it and watch a short documentary on the screen. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, beyond being a civil societal organization, MUD is a social hub or trying to be one, a, a, a gathering place uh, for different people, um, community leaders, the uh, neighborhood residents, as well as academics and graduate students. Uh, we have a library, a rooftop garden. Uh, we hold regular meetings, as well as city walks. Finally, and more uh, pertinent to our cause, perhaps, we have a very strong uh, research component. We support researchers. Uh, we have a, a, a research support fellowship for the last four years. Uh, the uh, products from that fellowship, they're published in this journal, we call it MUD Journal. Uh, we recently published uh, our first urban policy report on urban transformation and public health. And my favorite, the river basin studies. Uh, we focus on a 
river basin uh, every year and we organize field works. Um, a very interdisciplinary uh, take on uh, these uh, what, uh, river basins. We, uh, we have um, three weeks ago, we already, uh, our aim to, uh, this, this is the site uh, that is uh, based on the, uh, on storytelling rather than purely academic. Uh, we try to visualize uh, data as well as future interviews uh, and cover stories from the field. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, we visited Ergene, uh, Ergene River, uh, the main river system in the northern, northwesternmost corner this time of the country in Trace. Uh, Ergene River is one of the dirtiest, the most polluted rivers in Europe. Um, however, uh, it irrigates one of the most fertile lands in Turkey. Uh, Trace composed of like oh, around 3% of the uh, territory and 5% of the population, but responsible of around 20, 25% of its agricultural production. Uh, however, upstream is occupied by one of the largest organized industrial zones in the country, and that pollutes the river. Uh, river I mean, uh, environmental activists in Ergene, they no longer refer Ergene as a river. They prefer to call it Ergene Waste Canal because three third, uh, three fourth, excuse me, of its uh, water is coming uh, not from the uh, fresh resources, but from the wastes, toxic wastes of this uh, organized industrial zone. Uh, so one of the advantages of conducting field work as a group, as a part of an association in uh, in opposed to a classical um, one person um, academic work is that on the way others could join to your field work. Uh, as we spent some time, uh, actually we spent a week there along Ergene River, we were sharing as MUD Center for Spatial Justice through our Twitter and Instagram accounts, we were sharing uh, our journey, whatever we see, and those who follow it, especially if they are living the area, they join and they show uh, us around and share their personal stories. Uh, this particular daughter and father uh, joined us through Twitter. Um, we spent some time together. Uh, and we figured out that she uh, was, is 24 years old and a recent graduate of a university in Eskisehir. Uh, and she graduated and her degree was industrial design. When we asked her if she wants to stay in this locale or want to move to a large city, she told us that there isn't much work for her to do there. But we were surprised. I mean, you are surrounded with a lot of industrial uh, facilities, factories, et cetera, et cetera. That's the best place to be an industrial designer. And she uh, told us that she wants to design for, not for this industry, but the industry of the future of a more sustainable one. Uh, I'll think I'll stop here, uh, hoping that I'm not extremely over time. Thank you so thank much, you. Sina. That was, that was eye-opening and so, so informative. And, and thank you for sharing both your personal experiences and, and your academic work, your research work, and, and, and all this, um, the, the community uh, collaborative context as well. It's really wonderful. Uh, so uh, before I introduce our, our uh, second speaker, um, uh, Bashar Chan, I want to encourage the audience members to start uh, using the 
the Q&A function, the Q&A box at the bottom of their screen to start typing their questions uh, so that we can uh, uh, move swiftly to the Q&A part of our, uh, of our conversation today as soon as um, we, we're, we um, brush up John is, is uh, finished with their presentation. Uh, so Professor John is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Koch University also in Istanbul. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but Professor John is a medical anthropologist with research interests in the intersections of human rights, state violence, gender, politics of care and body. Uh, she's currently working on her book manuscript titled Forensic Fantasies, Doctors, Documents and the Limits of Truth in Turkey. Her research has appeared in several peer-reviewed uh, journals, including American Anthropologist, Medical Anthropology, Medical Anthropology Quarterly, Reproductive Health Matters, New Perspectives on Turkey, Media Culture and Society, Toplum ve Bilim, Toplum ve Hekim, among many other uh, publications. So I uh, give that over to Başak. Thank you. Thank you, Begim, for, for this introduction. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here today. And thank you again, Begüm, Mustafa, uh, Courtney, and Pamela for inviting me and organizing this talk. And thank you, Sinan, also for sharing all the amazing work they are doing at MAT. Um, so I want to start with a question that informs my my talk for today. And this is it. this. And the question is: What does the everyday life of an authoritarian rule vis-a-vis -vis knowledge production look like. There is a widespread acceptance that Turkey has become an authoritarian country in the last decade. We are reminded of how the Gezi Park uprising was repressed in 2013, how the peace process was ended 2015, how the emergency rule decrees became norm for two years following Kuatam in 2016. Yet focusing on, the, on key political events fall, might fall short of understanding the everyday operations of an authoritarian rule as well as challenges to it. So today I want to talk about the relationship between knowledge and power in the context of Turkey and how the centralization of knowledge and centralization of power are parallel processes. As a medical anthropologist, I will draw upon um, upon on um, my uh, draw upon my own and other medical and social researchers' experiences who conduct conduct research in official clinical settings in Turkey. Anthropologists have been doing research in various expert institutions such as bureaucracies, laboratories, companies since the seventies and. Besides deciding, besides the difficulties of gaining access to these sites, these institutions can monitor the accusation of, ex of their expert knowledge and can even police ethnographic and theoretical content. Indeed, most clinical and ethnographic researchers in Turkey talk about an increased grip of, us, of the centralized government committees on research processes. Before the mid 2000s, one was only required to resort to the administrative doctors in charge of a particular health institution to access an official clinical setting, such as a public hospital or primary healthcare unit. Researchers today need to gain official permission from the highest official authority in health, which is the Ministry of Health. The research permit is granted through the Provincial Directorate of Health and researchers must closely follow the rules and procedures stipulated by the directorate. However, following these rules do not guarantee one's access to uh, research sites. So let me give uh, an example. For her master's thesis, a bioethics graduate student decided to conduct qualitative research to understand why some parents refuse vaccines. This was before COVID. So she wanted to investigate the vaccine refusal forms and talk to doctors, nurses, uh, and families. After securing her university ethical committee's approval, she applied for permission at the provincial directorate of health. For this, she prepared, 
she had to prepare seven different documents, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but it was a, a quite, it requires quite a labor and it's a, it's a very emotion intensive process. So the first written response she received from the directorate was, we cannot give permission to this research without any further explanation. The student visited the directorate to understand why the permission was not granted. She was told that they did not want to share the information of the patients who refused vaccines on the grounds of, who refused vaccines on the grounds of the protection of privacy. They did not change their minds when she reminded them that she was going to protect the anonymity of the participants. The researcher reapplied and asked for permission to conduct research with doctors only. This time, the director gave her the research permit, but only on the condition that the findings could not be published without the director's final approval. So by separating research and publication permission processes, the administration was adding another bureaucratic layer. These obstacles had radical repercussions, at least for the students who decided to conduct research on another topic and uh, withdrew um, her research request. As we can see in this example, besides the already difficult application process, researchers face arbitrariness over the course of the process itself too. Um, however, this arbitrariness might sometimes surprising the work in favor of the researcher. The, perm the process does not always take as long, for example, if the researcher happens to, uh, have, happens to have a contact person in the directorate. These people might provide the researcher with hints regarding keywords, topics that they should avoid in their applications. For example, an official at the directorate once warned a public health professor that she should take off the words satisfaction and performance from her application because the government preferred to announce health satisfaction statistics itself based on the data collected through the Turkey Statistical Institute each year. That's why they keep denying any research who wants to do um, some research on questions of uh, patient satisfaction or um, performance of the healthcare. Um, this is both an indication of the government's desire to monopolize knowledge dissemination and also of the import attributed to the healthcare system uh, by the government for its own legitimacy. Other sensitive topics include family planning or the experiences of the LGBTQI plus people in the healthcare system. None of the medical researchers are interviewed could secure permission to investigate these topics in clinical settings. Family planning is probably considered a sensitive topic for it contradicts the government's pronatalist policy. In a similar way, given the lack of pro-LGBTIQ uh, policies in the healthcare system, the ministry might want to keep the difficulties these people experience in the healthcare system invisible. We might not know for sure the exact reasoning behind these prohibitions. However, official authorities distrust researchers and thus would like to keep them away from researching topics that they deem politically sensitive. Critical social scientists in Turkey are already familiar with the fact that it's hard to write a thesis or find a national funding on topics such as Kurdish or Armenian question. Yet what I want to highlight is that even seemingly non-political health related topics uh, might also an, emerge as new sites for government intervention. The last two years posed unique challenges for both ethnographers and medical researchers. Most field-based researchers suspended their fieldwork due to the risks associated with the uh, COVID. However, medical researchers such as infectious disease specialists or public health specialists, they were curious to understand how the COVID-19 has spread among the population, 
What are the medical consequences of available treatment for different age or gender groups and so on. As opposed to many other countries where the national COVID data is open and accessible, um, this hasn't been the case in Turkey, let alone sharing national data with medical specialists, the government introduced a new regulation requiring all researchers to inform the Ministry of Health if they were going to conduct COVID-related research. Some medical experts interpreted this as a government intervention to scientific research while the ministry defended itself by saying that they aim to increase cooperation among medical experts working on different topics. So what do you then researchers do when the doors of official clinical settings or official data are closed to them? Is it ever possible then to propose a transparent research proposal to the administrative committees? To whom? are we as researchers primarily responsible to our research participants, funders, the administrative institutions, the public, the university? Do we have an ethical obligation to all these parties? Fed up with pro problems with permission processes, a public health specialist I talked to uh, suggested that, quote, as long as we stay silent and frightened, these officials will continue to give us a continue to give us a hard time. Why do we need the official administrative permission in the first place if we already have the consent of the doctor and the patient and the approval of the uh, ethical committees um, uh, in our, of, the, of the university? Let's just do our work without, without their permission and this is how we'll change the situation, end of quote. Given that there's no clear mechanism for implementing sanctions uh, for those who do not ask for permission, many health researchers are indeed just taking the risk and um, not even bothering to apply for research permission at the level of ministry before starting their research on COVID, for example. They argue that the IRB approval should do it. Yet this is not a viable option for, uh, for many researchers, including field researchers who need these administrative uh, approvals to enter the clinical research, uh, clinical uh, sites. The practice of preparing research methods, proposals, articles in ways that will not touch the sensitivities of the government might have serious consequences for researchers in the long run. Junior researchers might end up internalizing a silent and recessive positionality vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with the state uh, in their analysis. Moreover, by hiding patients, doctors, health data from researchers, these officials are not only pushing away alternative and critical understandings of the experiences of patients and doctors, but also uh, potentially imposing a partisan vision of healthcare in Turkey. However, I would like to end on a positive note. The practice of research is a dynamic process that is fraught with unforeseen challenges as well as opportunities. The frequent encounters with different state officials for research pur purposes might provide the researcher with an intimate knowledge of how the state works at the everyday level. We get to meet state officials who genuinely want to help us, as well as the, those who embody the government ideology. The wide range of official responses gives us a grounded understanding of the fragmented and contested nature of the state apparatus. In a similar vein, the narratives of doctors and patients might highlight the gap between the official representations of healthcare and the, their practical everyday experiences in these official clinical settings. All in all, the vulnerability of the researcher vis-a-vis -vis the official permission processes might situate her at the margins of the state but it is from these margins that uh, very critical insights about the state power and authoritarianism might spring. Uh, thank you. This is the end of my talk.
Thank you so much, Bashak. That was really, uh, also very interesting and informative and, and really important uh, presentation. Uh, it was wonderful to also hear more about your, your, your work as well. Uh, so we do have a, a number of uh, sort of uh, questions already uh, uh, piling up in the Q&A. So, so I'll start with those and then, and then uh, if, if we have time, I'll, I'll also ask a, a couple of questions of my own. Uh, so my colleague uh, is asking, uh, saying, starting with, do you, thank you for your presentations. Do you think there's sufficiently outspoken resistance and opposition in the academia against the authoritarian rule, except for Boazici? And how does the general academic response compare in relation to other professions, such as journalists, lawyers, artists, and businessmen? Well, that's a fair. Can you hear me all right? That, well, that's a fair but a challenging question. Uh, I mean, until recently, there wasn't much resistance and opposition anywhere, uh, particularly the failure to get organized and bring together different segments of the opposition was lacking so uh, deeply. Uh, but in terms of the academia, I mean, general consensus is that the academia failed miserably, particularly because it's the member of the academia who initiated, instrumentalized those purchases before anybody else. Um, and, and, and other consensus, I think, I think uh, it's, it's not just about the current moment uh, prior to these purges, Turkish academia was in already a deep crisis, uh, reasons of which could be traceable to different sources, um, neoliberalism, um, mass universities, opening up new universities everywhere, uh, issues with meritocracy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but compared to other occupations, well, I mean, I don't know, I mean, what, why are we looking at particular occupations to have a better sense of the uh, level of uh, success of opposition? I'm not sure about that, but um, the businessmen, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, until recently, I think they were having a really good time uh, under this man, man rule under authoritarianism. And that is perhaps why they had all the right to not to resist. Um, should I say something or? Oh. Like. Okay, so um, um, yeah, I, I also agree with Sinan. And the, um, you might remember, Begum also mentioned the, his peace petition. I, tend to think that moment as a, as a very important um, a breaking point in the Turkish academia. Maybe it was one of the most unique moments in the sense that many academics uh, who, who from all over Turkey uh, signed that petition. It was an amazing turnout. So uh, nobody was expecting that, that many um, scholars, uh, very young academics, assistant professors, uh, teaching assistants, they all signed that petition. So it just showed how that kind of critical intellectual knowledge production and this um, translated into uh, some language of resistance or some political attitude. So it, it was really an amazing moment to, to show that. But of course, it was also a breaking point in the sense that uh, those who were in the Anatolia were in the most uh, vulnerable positions, and they were the first who were dismissed their positions, um, and they, they had to face with all these uh, um, lynchings and, and um, different kinds of exclusion. So, yeah, so it was still an important so yeah, I, I tend to think when I look at academy, but I, I also think that um, there we couldn't show the academy as it is today, maybe because of all the um, uh, difficulties it has been going through uh, 
especially for critical intellectuals in the academia, uh, the solidarity with the Bozji to, my, to, to, to me was very limited, was, was too weak. Um, so that's, that's my, my, I don't know what Sina thinks about it, but. It, <laughs> Thank you. To, to maybe continue on the, on the topic of okay. the, uh, the academic uh, freedom, uh, I, uh, there's a question about sort of how, how is the control by the government on research and faculty also maybe impacting undergraduate students? Uh, do you have a sense of do they feel it? And uh, has, has there been an impact also in, in, in the curriculum for, for undergraduate education as well? Asha, you want to go first? You can, or? No, you can stop. Well, yeah, there, there are attempts to censorship and control, uh, definitely. However, I mean, self-censorship, I think, is more uh, critical in this respect. I mean, in my answer to the previous question, I was talking about uh, it, it is the um, faculty, members of the academia who made these purchases and controls and censorship uh, uh, possible without their active involvement. I'm, I'm not generalizing it, of course, uh, but I mean, it's, it's really difficult for a government, no matter how authoritarian it is, to control every single aspect of everything, right? Uh, you need to have some people giving consent or actively pursuing the agenda of the government, not, not of the government, but certain segments per perhaps within the government uh, with their help and with their enthusiasm, actually uh, control and censorship go a longer way, I, guess, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that I've been observing in the last couple of years from my own experience uh, from myself I can realize that I uh, I feel that I cannot give some examples I used to give let's say four or five years ago and I say maybe there will be someone in class will be filming me or recording me and I just want that to, to circulate in social media. So there is definitely this uh, uh, self-censorship uh, on my part. But other than this, uh, I've been, as I mentioned in my talk, to witnessing that my students have been experiencing a lot of difficulties as they try to gain access to these uh, research sites. Um, when I first started, and it was not long ago, um, mentoring graduate students, so it was much easier and we could just, for example, I remember a student going to, uh, going uh, and granting research, uh, grant permission to do research in police academy. So I just wrote them a letter and they just agreed and they called me to, to, um, uh, to, to uh, make sure that she is a real student. And so just they let him let her in and, and she spent their time and witnessed their classes. So, so um, now many places you feel that it's you, you just cannot have access. There is no communication. They just uh, cut you out. So uh, because I, I see students just going to this directorate uh, again and again um, and receiving the same uh, response. Uh, so yeah, it's getting difficult and I'm, I'm, we have to change topics all the time. So maybe you shouldn't do state ethnography. Why don't we look, do yeah, another kind of research? Yeah, this happens. And, 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 and even, even if, if I may, uh, even if they miraculously get some access, uh, the bureaucrats, public officers are so uh, silent. I mean, they don't answer any question compared to, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago. That's, that's another, maybe they're becoming a little louder or they intend to nowadays since the uh, public polls are uh, suggesting a change. Uh, I, I don't know. But I mean, I, I personally experience how those talkative, uh, sometimes 
overly talkative public officers and bureaucrats, uh, how they how they chose to not to answer emails and and, and phone calls. Thank you. Um, so there's a question for Bashak. Uh, what will be possible solutions to inform the public in a transparent way related to public health issues when the state intervenes and prohibits sharing of knowledge with the wider public? Does the risks of medical staff, uh, can, can they be decreased when they share knowledge contradictory to state policies and, and ideologies? Um, oh, thank you, that's a great question. So the, the good thing about the, with all this dark picture is that uh, Turkey has a very strong public public health tradition and uh, public health specialist experts have their own associations. Uh, Turkish Medical Association is, is, is very vocal. So, and they are helping each other out as they try to uh, gain access to data. Um, if you want to do research in state hospitals, yes, you have to go through um, directorate, that is Ministry of Health. But if you want to do a research at the university hospital, so you can do that because you don't have to go to the directorate and people have connections there uh, at the level of um, some connections. People know each other in the medical uh, uh, field. And this, or there are lots of private hospitals. There are very huge um, private hospitals and they have their own data. So even though they don't have access to this national data, uh, they find ways of conducting research, definitely. So they just don't sit there and wait. Um, and they are vocal about the. And they, maybe you've heard there has been this, over the summer, debate between the Ministry of Health and the uh, representatives of associations, um, some health associations regarding um, the um, distribution and dissemination of national data. and. Um, so people are, so it was uh, in Lancet. So people are working hard but, uh, to have access to that data, but they are so used to not having access to that. They develop their own ways of doing research, getting data. Uh, but the problem is, yeah, they, there isn't much uh, scientific research coming out of uh, Turkey regarding COVID. Uh, um, um, at the national level. So this, this is one problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, for Sinan, also a research specific question, how can we approach uh, the scope of spatial injustice in Turkey uh, within the context of Islam and capitalism? Does the manifestation of spatial injustice through critical media uh, offer an alternative solution to, the, to limit the impact of spatial injustice? That's an audience question. Well, I mean, in, in terms of the reach and scope of this vision of in spatial justice, I think the, there is a huge growing interest in uh, environmental, urban and environmental injustice issues. Uh, there is a plethora of new uh, associations, uh, foundations, small platforms uh, all around. Anatolia, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, pa of course, parallel to the spatial interventions of uh, IKP's political, the machine of political economy. Um, but I mean, of course, it's an open question uh, where that interest in spatial issues, whether in the countryside or in urban settings would be ch channeled into. Um, I mean, I observe more and more political parties are picking up on uh, the terms and slogans um, of uh, environment, urban environmental movements uh, have been voicing for the last decade. And that is encouraging, of course. But on the other hand, uh, these are not topics, these are not sensibilities unique to the opposition, right? Uh, the government uh, is also able to, you know, absorb them, use them, um, color them, change them in its own uh, uh, view. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, that's, that's also happening. 
uh, we are seeing it in the uh, this growing number of millet bahçeleri, the uh, the gardens of nation popping up uh, every major city in Turkey. We are also uh, seeing this in this what is called sıfır uh, atık program, zero waste program, and whenever the justice part is absence, of course there are problems. I mean these urban and environmental programs and projects, it, it, they don't necessarily uh, result in fair, equitable, democratic, even ecological uh, uh, outcomes. Um, and, and the zero waste program is just an example of that. In the recent uh, weeks, we've been witnessing how uh, the waste pickers, the informal waste pickers, uh, how they've been bullied and their uh, carts and spaces are being uh, 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 raided uh, just to replace them with a more modern so-called ecological um, uh, waste disposal uh, units or, or uh, facilities. And so there's a co-optation of, of uh, various uh, social justice struggles. As well. um, so, uh, so we have another uh, audience question about sort of going back to the uh, academic questions. Uh, they're, they're asking about the emphasis you've made, uh, you have both made about solidarity between academics and students or young scholars in Turkey. Is there currently enough solidarity among these groups and if the intersections of their current struggles and these solidarities may actually help us imagine the possibility of a different type of university? So the most recent events, maybe uh, many of us have been following is this, the, the students who have been uh, fighting against this, uh, the right to, um, pardon me, what's it? Um, uh, shelter. because shelter maybe yes uh, because of the increased rents and uh, even at coach university usually we don't see much protest here at coach but even uh, because for various reasons but people couldn't um, find do places in dormitories they couldn't rent ho houses in the area so they have been organizing these protests and they have been definitely in contact with, with all these different groups. And they also call themselves Coach Solidarity. And this is something that we have been observing people on different campuses um, um, organizing in the form of solidarities. So which, which is very inspiring because it allows them to communicate and uh, share their um, protest strategies, but I'm not. Uh, uh, so the, the, this is most exciting form of solidarity that I have been observing uh, in recent months. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a related question in, in, in a way that has to do with sort of they're inspired by what Bashak was saying earlier about um, sort of the challenges that, that medical researchers face and the relationship between uh, knowledge production and political legitimacy. Uh, do you also think that there might be a bifurcation in knowledge production in the sense that while some critical academics face serious challenges, others actually enjoy uh, privileges and incentives? Do you think the AKP government also takes proactive st uh, steps to produce partisanal knowledge in that through academia? I don't know, probably yes. <laughs> um, so all these professors that we've been uh, watching on mainstream, mainstream media nowadays are definitely trying to that kind of hegemonic work for the current government. Um, even though they are not experts on, for example, international affairs, but they are because they're political scientists, they're talking about Syria in a way to um, legitimize the current government. But uh, what we are seeing rather is that many very talented, smart, critical intellectuals are just leaving the country. 
this is what's happening. And as a result, we are just uh, losing this richer intellectual uh, environment. So in that sense, it, these two cannot be separated. So that increased authoritarianism and people leaving the country. And um, so the, the, the level of intellectual debate is getting um, to, to, to me is weaker and uh, Did you, did you want to jump in? Yeah, well, the, the question starts with this term bifurcation, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, bifurcation in different firms existed in Turkish academia in various ways, again, prior to these recent purges. And perhaps with so many young, talented people are forced out of academia and uh, migrating to, to different places, maybe uh, in a few years we'll be talking about, I don't know, what is the term? Morfurcation, I mean, is, is that a term? That could, that could also, I mean, different layers of hierarchy uh, could, could be the end result of this shakedown. Is it good or is it worse? Than bifurcation, uh, I, I'm I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, moving through, there's lots of questions, and they're all very interesting and exciting. So I'm, I'm going to keep reading them. Uh, we have a question about uh, sort of censorship on certain topics of transgression and, and uh, public health, which have already been in effect. Uh, so. Um, like uh, the attitudes towards sex work, uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, this has been in effect for a while and they're becoming much more uh, uh, widespread. So what are the main topics in public health that receive financial or bureaucratic support from the government? What are the methodological or epistemological strategies you develop to overcome or maybe analyze the censorship itself? And how is your teaching experience also affected by this? <laughs> Thank you, Asli, for this very difficult question. <laughs> so, um, sorry, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I actually, so what I remember from my research with the public health um, specialists is that they said it kept changing, that is, which topics are granted uh, permission uh, and which topics are seemed more um, uh, dangerous uh, on the part of the government uh, keep changing. Uh, so that's why it's important for them to be in contact with people who work at the directorate because there are lots of nice officials just want to help people, including researchers. And they say, okay, Hojam, let's not try to use these words these days. So they don't like uh, reading proposals at the ministry that includes where such a satisfaction or they don't want to hear anything about LGBTQI people. So um, as, at least as I was doing research, these two uh, were, were very prominent. They just didn't want to hear anything, these two. Or so, also, they don't want to let any research on fa family planning. They didn't want anything about vaccine refusal. So the, the, the way uh, people deal with this was to change the um, uh, framing of the research. So changing the emphasis from, I don't know, not saying vaccine refusal, but saying uh, children who are, I don't know, make, so making sure not to use vaccine or refusal or not using family planning, but instead saying something else. So um, they are looking for apparently some keywords. So it just takes a lot of time to, to read all proposals. But, um, but for my research, I've been, uh, some of you know, I've been doing research with doctors who work in the field of human rights documentation. And what I experienced was similar to what Sinan said in the sense that at least in the last years, in, in recent years, people, doctors were more, hesitant in the sense that they didn't want to talk more about themselves, didn't talk about themselves, their, um, I don't know, their feelings, and they, they just didn't give 
mm, didn't want to give their names or uh, so they were i this is what i felt very much as i talked to you especially with doctors who work at the hospitals but th what i did was uh, not to ask for uh, a permission at the hospital because uh, when I want to talk to a doctor, instead I wanted to uh, reach him or her via personal networks. So I didn't go to the hospital and ask for permission because so it, it wouldn't, so he or she wouldn't feel comfortable seeing a person coming here from the, uh, from official uh, and wouldn't want to talk about state violence or human rights violations. So I've always preferred uh, to mobilize personal networks to make sure that they know me and uh, and I was referred by a person that they know so that they would trust me and I would ensure their anonymity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa, you had a question? Jump, jump in. Um, yeah, I, if you don't mind, I actually, it's uh, we're, we're almost out of time. There's about a minute left. So I really wanted to uh, uh, ask you a question that is, very important to me, particularly as the director of this uh, um, initiative. People that work uh, on the region in general, but really anybody who's interested in academic freedom and wanting to actually help uh, uh, our colleagues um, in places like Turkey where they're facing right now challenges, to say the least, when it comes to academic freedom, we're, we're often kind of faced with an impossible choice uh, of what do we do? Uh, do we boycott? Uh, doesn't that isolate our colleagues? Do we uh, lift the voices of our colleagues that are working uh, hard to do it? Does that mean we ignore those that are not able to speak up because of different conditions or different universities they work in? What do you think people who are um, invested in academic freedom from outside of Turkey can do to help maybe place pressure or uh, push the voices of those that are working for change, people like us. And the question is to both Bashak and Sina. Well, that's that's a super difficult question, to be honest with you, because I mean, sometimes, I mean, always international solidarity, it, it, it always helps, definitely. It encourages, uh, it, it, it's a testament that you are being heard, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes international support could backfire as well because there is this growing anti-international solidarity thing that has been going on uh, in Turkey for a while now. So, so there's, a, there's a thin line there. I mean, in terms of boycott, I think it has been discussed uh, in... Turkish academia through, through different chapters in the last five, ten, five, five years or so. And I don't think there's a consensus uh, 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 regarding how to uh, uh, respond to that question. Because uh, engagement, I mean, close engagement with uh, Turkish academics, uh, particularly those who are being uh, harassed and silenced, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is much more important than, I think, a, a boycott of, of 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 any sort. And and on the other hand, I mean, this goes back to my initial comment about the possibility of backfire. Um, so rather than boycott, I mean, if there's a consensus over it. I would definitely, I would definitely support it. it, but 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 I don't think there is a consensus on that. And and I mean, being mindful, seeking out opportunities of engagement, uh, organizing webinars and panels like this, but not not also not not only panels and discussions, but also like uh, hands-on research as well, uh, collaborative work of different kind. Uh, would, would be great, along yeah. with petitions and statements, etc. Et yeah, thank you. I mostly agree with Sinan, but plus I might also say that if because there were at least at the time of the purges against um, purges against academics for peace, um, the group decided that 
um, boycott should be implemented and international institutions should be invited to boycott institutions that expel these academics. So but I think, the, yes. and the, there, there were certain um, uh, they criteria. And um, so as long as it's around certain principles that will it be that will be implemented to all institutions, um, I think boycott might also work. So because solidarity might backfire, boycott might backfire, everything can backfire in that context. So so boycott is might be an important instrument. I definitely agree. But so there might be uh, some some sort of agreement and some some it should be thought out well. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. I think we're thank you. Out of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're so grateful for you sharing about your research, about your experiences as scholars, and for being so so open and, and generous. We're really, really very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for inviting us. Yeah, uh, I would like to add my voice and say thank you so much for this. It's uh, it's uh, wonderful. Um, uh, we look forward to more conversations uh, about this and other topics that are happening in Turkey, and we will be uh, engaging with you quite a bit. Um, I also want to thank uh, Begum for for being so generous with her time and and agreeing to moderate this. We're really grateful. Of course, Bashak and Sinan, again, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you to the audience that stuck around for an extra five minutes almost. So we appreciate you. And uh, before I go, uh, I want to do yet another reminder of uh, uh, our upcoming event. Courtney, do you have the yes? Thank you so much. So it's going to be Iraq uh, from the inside out uh, with two Iraqi scholars, and it will be November 1st again at noon from uh, from noon to 115. Both scholars are uh, heritage experts and architects, and uh, they both um, live and work in Baghdad. Uh, so it should be a very, very interesting um, conversation. Thanks again, and hope to see you all soon.